If you clicked on this video, don't leave it. I am sure that you will be presented with content that will not leave you disappointed. Our starting point is the world's best-selling book, the Bible. We will read the King James Version of the first verses. The Bible begins with, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Let's imagine that you want to study this subject. So, on the King James Bible online website, you look for other available translations. If you really want to know what is written, in fact, you need to look for a literal translation version. Then you find in the list, Young's Literal Translation, and you will be able to read God in the first verse and you will be able to read something very similar to what you were presented with earlier. Then you will look for other versions, and you will find practically all of them the same. Then you try the Hebrew and, of course, it is written in Hebrew. But if you are like me, who does not understand Hebrew, you will be left without understanding what is written. So, we conclude that we will need to look for a version that contains a literal translation. And in this case, I suggest, if you want to research, I suggest to you the version that I installed on my computer, Interlinear Scripture Analyzer. And in this way, you will see with your own eyes and with your own research what I will present here. Let's read again the first five verses of the Bible in a literal translation. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. As for the earth, it came to be a chaos and vacant, and darkness was over the surface of the abyss, and the spirit of Elohim was vibrating over the surface of the waters. And Elohim said, Let light come to be, and light came to be. Elohim saw the light that it was good. Then Elohim separated the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And evening came to be, and morning came to be, day one. And then the truth appear. Easily you will understand that God, in English, is a translation of the Hebrew Elohim. After all, in all available versions, we understand this. But a quick search on Google and a simple definition from Wikipedia would be prepared to demonstrate that this is not true. Elohim, the plural of Eloah, is a Hebrew word meaning gods or godhood. Although the word is plural, in the Hebrew Bible, it most often takes singular, verbal, or pronominal agreement and refers to a single deity, particularly the God of Israel. In other verses, it refers to the singular gods of other nations, or to deities in the plural. The word Elohim is a grammatically plural noun for gods, or deities, or various other words in Biblical Hebrew. So if I can understand clearly, this means to say that the term Elohim is plural and means gods. However, by virtue of an agreement, it is understood that Elohim should be understood in the singular, and it is then the same as God. I understand. But why then, in the King James Version, in Genesis 1.26, do we read, And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. 
And in the literal translation version we read, And Elohim said, Let us make humanity in our image and according to our likeness. Isn't it plural in this case, let us in our image? Isn't it plural? However, we have the explanation that God would be talking to his angels, or that this would be the majestic plural for God. But the sands of time have revealed a different subject. The discovery of the library of Nineveh brought us the Mesopotamian tablets. At that time, the interest of the great institutions was precisely to prove the biblical narratives through new discovered documents. What happened was the opposite. What was proven, in fact, is precisely the opposite. The documents found showed direct dependence. If the Hebrew Bible reveals a narrative, the tablets reveal more complete and broader narratives with a depth and richness of details much greater. In the story of the Flood, for example, if it is possible to read God or Yahweh in a conventional translation, the literal translation reveals that some actions are practiced by Elohim, the plural term, and others by Yahweh, the singular term that reveals the name of the God of Israel. But this is very strange. What sense does it make to write a text using different names for the same thing, being that this thing is God? Some at this point in the video could already accuse me of blasphemy or say that I do not have enough theological knowledge to know that Yahweh and Elohim are just different names for the same God. But the truth is just the opposite. We are not used to reading the Bible as it is. We are used to reading the Bible as it was read and written for us, as it was told and retold to us through the centuries, millennia, and the conventions that were made. In the context of Christianity, the story becomes even more confusing. And I will demonstrate this to you. Jesus, when referring to the Father, uses different nomenclatures in the original Greek. In Luke 23:34, he refers to God as Father, from the Greek term Pater. In John 10:30, when saying that he and the Father are one, the same term Pater is clear. Jesus, in various passages, claims to be doing the will of the Father. And clearly the Jews do not accept him saying this, the Jews do not recognize him as the son of the same father. They claim that Jesus is blaspheming. Now just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. Subscribe and also click that notification bell so you won't miss any of the next videos that are uploaded every day. Alright, let's keep rolling. In some passages, Jesus is pointed out as Theo, son of God, and refers to God as Theos. In this sense, in a quick analysis, we have so far the following words that are translated as God in our Bibles that we have in our homes. From Hebrew, Elohim, Yahweh. From Greek, Potter, Theos, Theon. So I ask you, can we understand all these terms as God? For the Jews, obviously not. The Hebrews accused Jesus of blasphemy, as they did not identify him as the son of Yahweh. And in fact, I just summarized the little that I showed you. If we look even deeper, we would find other words that involving the name of God such as El, El Elyon, El Shaddai, Adonai, Yah, Kyrios, Despotes, Pneumotheos, Logos. Actually, it is necessary to highlight here a great confusion. Is Jesus the Messiah or not? Is Jesus' Father Yahweh or not? We can have different interpretations and different readings, as well as different theological explanations for this. But invariably, the truth is only one even though we may not be able to fully grasp it. It either is or it isn't. 
There is no way this answer can be doubly correct or partially correct. The fact that we do not have access to the truth, from my point of view, obliges us all to be calm and patient with people who think differently from us. And more than that, respect, utmost respect. No one has the truth. We are all learners. All of this was already sufficiently complicated. But later, when we learn about the Anunnaki, the complexity is accentuated. The Anunnaki subject reveals a truth that bothers many people. Many attack this channel and other channels. And from my point of view, they are extremely simplistic in their analysis. They say, the Anunnaki are fallen angels. But, no, the Anunnaki are not fallen angels. The Anunnaki are the Elohim, and they are duly identified in creation. In texts such as the Atrahasis epic, Enuma Elish, among others, it is very well explained that they are the creators of humanity and, therefore, identify with the plural term Elohim. In addition, the Anunnaki also identify with the creation of the universe in the Enuma Elish. Just as Elohim identifies itself at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1, the fallen angels are the sons of God, or the sons of the gods, who in the Hebrew Bible are called Benai Elohim. These must then be the children of the main Anunnaki, perhaps. In the case of Genesis 6 and in a joint analysis with the Book of Enoch, we have the Benai Elohim, who descend from the heavens, and these are the fallen angels. And the fallen angels have children with earthly women. These are the Nephilim. Nephilim are interpreted as beings of great stature, but in reality they are of great stature, not literally in terms of their height, but in terms of their deeds, their scope, their power. Nephilim, from the term Nephal, means the one who fell, and not necessarily giants. Probably these are the demigods like Gilgamesh and Hercules. Perhaps the Goliath that David defeated. Zechariah Sitchin, when writing the work, the Twelfth Planet referred to the Anunnaki as Nephilim. But later, he corrected this term due to the understanding that the Anunnaki are, in fact, the Elohim. There are interviews here on YouTube where he makes this very clear. In addition, Sitchin explains that the term El Elyon refers to God with a capital G, that is, the true God above the Anunnaki. And I must make it clear, this is Zechariah Sitchin's view. When we study the Sumerian texts, or using the correct term, the Mesopotamian texts, which precede the Bible by centuries and millennia, we find a narrative that observes from the creation of the universe and the worlds to the time when only the gods walked on earth. Later we observe the creation of humans, the flood, the beginning of civilization, and the first contacts of gods, in the plural, with humans. The Mesopotamian texts make it very clear that among the different gods, different visions imposed themselves. In the beginning, only the gods walked on earth. Among these gods, there were the great gods, the Anunnaki, and the lesser or the junior gods called the Igigi. The Igigi, the lesser gods, worked and these junior gods organized a protest, a mutiny, and before Enlil, in the Ekur, they protested so that they would no longer work. Thus, one of the great gods, Enki proposed the creation of a primitive worker. In some texts like Enki and Ninma, Enki manipulates instruments for the creation of humanity. In other texts, Enki inspires the phantom or breath of life to animate a human body, as if endowing it with a soul. Among these gods, one of them is the father of all, and his name means Most High. This is An for the Sumerians, and Anu for the Akkadians. 
He is represented by a simple star and also by the Maltese cross. His dwelling is in the celestial abode and he is the heaven itself, the sky of Anu. The representation of his name, the Most High, can be equivalent to El Elyon, the Most High for the Hebrews in the Hebrew Bible. And for those who imagine and affirm that the Anunnaki themselves believed in the great creator of everything, it must be said, this is an interpretation of Zechariah Sitchin. In the available Mesopotamian texts for reading, in the originals, I have never read any mention of Galzu or the creator of everything. This is, as I said, an interpretation of Sitchin. Moreover, for Sitchin, Yahweh is the manifestation of the creator of everything himself. Yahweh is the very creator of everything. This is Sitchin's conclusion in the book Divine Encounters. A conclusion that I vehemently disagree with. Just as it is an interpretation of Sitchin that Marduk, Ra, and Amun-Ra are the same god. But the fact is, his interpretation seems very plausible. And in this sense, it must be said. Marduk appears in the Bible as Baal and Merodach, according to various interpretations. And in the Hebrew Bible, we observe several times the biblical god Yahweh claiming to be the only one and prohibiting worship of the deity Astarte, who is known as the Morning Star, Inanna for the Sumerians, and Ishtar for the Akkadians, just as we see the condemnation of any worship of Baal and Merodach or Marduk. Just as we also notice that Yahweh seems not to accept the worship of Amun or any other god of the Egyptian pantheon. And in fact, Yahweh does not accept worship to anyone else beyond worship to himself. When Yahweh presents himself to Moses, the situation becomes very clear. He, Yahweh, claims to be the one who also presented himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai that is, as God Almighty, but that he did not previously reveal himself to them as Yahweh. It seems we have two sides here, don't we? Zechariah Sitchin interpreted it as being the clan of Enki and the clan of Enlil. In the Mesopotamian accounts of the Flood, in the Tablets, we clearly described that Enki wants to save humanity, wants to stop the annihilation of his creatures. And we have seen this in the video of the Eridu Genesis. And we will see something similar in Tablet 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh, as well as in the Epic of Atrahasis. Enki wants to save humanity and Enlil. He himself sends drought, famine, diseases, and finally the Flood. For Sitchin, the cause of the Flood is the passage of Nibiru. For the traditional myths that I have read, it is not Nibiru, but Enlil himself, who decides to annihilate humanity with the Flood. And Enki decides to save humanity. In the Hebrew Bible, we read the term Elohim at times, and at other times Yahweh, in the functions that are of Enki and Enlil which denotes, obviously, that these older writings, in this case, the Mesopotamian tablets, not only inspired the writers of the Bible, who copied their writings, but summarized their writings, and above all, altered them, in order to confuse and make believe in a single God, when in fact there was more than one. Could it be that the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, is different from the God of the New Testament. Could this be the reason why Jesus says he speaks in the name of the Father, that whoever saw him saw the Father, but that, in fact, Jesus' Father was not the same Yahweh? Perhaps for this reason, he was killed. This topic is extremely complex. It is also necessary to observe that some of the terms to which Jesus referred to his father, Pater, automatically refer us to very ancient deities, such as Diaus Pita from the Vedic pantheon. 
literally translated as Sky Father. Diospeda is one of the oldest known deities, originating from Proto-Indo-European mythology, embodying the daytime sky and serving as the father of gods and men. As we trace the lineage of Diospeda, we find a direct evolution in ancient Greece with Zeuspeda, which also appears in Rome as Jupiter. The name Jupiter is derived from Jus Potter, a conjunction of Diospeda and Potter, translating to Sky Father. These names also bear similarities with Jovi or Jovis, which was another name for the same Jupiter, and which is incredibly similar to the name Yahweh or Jehovah. So, would it be the same Potter? Would it be Diospeda or Great Father? Would Jesus be referring to the same Father in the sky? Or would they be different? On one side of the clan of Enlil, on the other, the clan of Enki. This would lead us to the same father of all the gods, the Most High, An or Anu. He lives in the celestial abode, his name means heavens, and his pictographic sign also represents the cross. Through the evolution of the cuneiform symbol to the Hebrew letter Tav, and which consequently gave rise to the letter T. Incredibly, this one, An or Anu, which divides into two clans can also be interpreted as zero, the beginning, which is known through the one, and which therefore divides into the binary of yin and yang. I believe that as far as we have come in this video, it is enough to verify how extremely enchanting and complex this subject is. And this one that serves as a brief summary of all this complexity is the father of many documentaries. I think we all like to hear these stories involved in a tone of mystery, reverence, doubt, and admiration. And for the Sumerians, Anu for the Assyrians, is the father of the Anunnaki, father of Enki and Enlil. He is the greatest of the gods of the first mythology in the history of the world. Some point to Anu as equivalent to Jupiter for the Romans, Zeus for the Greeks, and El for the Canaanites. Although in the Enuma Elish myth, Anu is not the first, Anu is pointed out as being at the top of Sumerian mythology. George Smith, in the book The Chaldean Account of Genesis in 1876, explained that Anu is pictographically represented by a star, and that he is the personification of the heavens itself, also represented by the Maltese cross. Mauro Biglino also clarifies that the Hebrew term Elion refers to the same high highest term, which also leads to Anu in the Mesopotamian clay tablets. In addition, the pictographic symbol offered to An is the Dingir symbol, which means God. His name, therefore, is inscribed in all gods as the highest and greatest of all. And his symbol, the star, the cross, the heavens, the celestial abode, is the representation that later, in history, became the letter T and signifies the heavens itself and the Most High. But the analysis of mythology and ancient texts very clearly show that there is a great confusion between different ancient entities classified as gods. And no, we should not demonize them. The ancient deities are our fathers and our mothers, and their marks are in our collective unconscious and are part of the archetypes of our life. I hope that you, despite all the doubts and studies that surround this subject, can find the divine within you. For my part, I have no doubts about the divine and the existence of God, of a whole and the sacred. But I also have serious doubts that our religions, I believe most of them, position the divine too far, too high, at a height that we cannot reach. And besides this, they blame our humanity for terrible and sinful acts, thus separating the divine from man. Humanity is sinful and unworthy. God is all-powerful and we should fear him. 
This conception, which is in almost all religions, is the opposite of my thinking. To me, we are divine, and the divine spark resides in all of us. My work here on this channel, I clearly perceive, is to bring my knowledge, research, and reflections to help you awaken your divine. It is like the myth of Prometheus stealing the fire from the gods. It is the light of knowledge that illuminates the darkness of ignorance. This is my thought, and you don't have to agree with it. Through this video, I would like to demonstrate to you the complexity of the subject, and I want you to also realize that I am not here on this channel, offering empty and fanciful documentaries. Many times I bring and will still bring Sitchin's vision, as it must be known. But beyond this, it is essential to bring comparative studies as I have been doing. I classified this video as the most important so far because I need to demonstrate to you the many different perspectives regarding all this. May peace, the forces of harmony and love of the infinite cosmic universe reach you. See you in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.